went through where? Where was it? Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And so that's some, some awesome, some awesome barbecue there in you know, North and South Carolina. I, I still need to hit up um, Kansas and Oklahoma. Those are two of the, the remaining states that I haven't been to yet that I, that I hope to get to before the end of the year. Um, this offset smoker, by the way, was made in Oklahoma. It's a great little company, Horizon, that, um, that makes... This, I think, is actually one of the smaller offset smokers that they make. I think they have a nickname, The General, which is, is apt, given that it, uh, when you carry it around in your backyard, it basically is like a tank. <laughs> All right. What, um, what else is going on? All right. Oh, Justine. Oh, thank you. You're talking about my, my commencement address at, at Harvard. Um, I, I appreciate that. I, I, put, I put a lot of time into that. That, that meant a lot to, to my parents. I, I promised my parents that one day I would go back and, and graduate from, from Harvard. So even though I, I didn't really graduate, but I got, I got a, um, an honorary degree, which I, I guess is as good as I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do in my life. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, the themes that, that, I, that I talked about there, I mean, a lot of that is based on, you know, what, what I've learned building Facebook and, um, and some of what I've seen traveling around the country this year, right? I mean, this, this idea that, um, you know, a lot of the commencements are just about how, oh, you need to go find your own purpose. But I think where, where society is going overall, I mean, our big challenge isn't for you individually to, to go find uh, your sense of purpose and what matters to you. It's how do we build a, a society overall where everyone has the opportunity to go and, and pursue their purpose and have a, have a sense of purpose and meaning in, in their lives. And, you know, one of the things that I've just found by, by traveling around is, um, you know, there isn't always in as many places as much opportunity as there used to be. Right? You go around now, um, you know, if you look at, you, I, I visit a lot of rural places and, and I visit a lot of uh, urban places that I hadn't been to before. And, you know, if you go back 30 or 40 years in this country, um, you know, there was a lot of opportunity in, in both, um, almost equal, right? I mean, you could you could go, you could grow up, you could move to a city, you'd get you'd have some opportunity there, or you could stay in a rural environment. There was a lot of opportunity there. There were factories, a lot of farming was still was booming and growing quickly. Um, and now, you know, one of the one of the big interesting themes is that um, you know a, a lot of people who are living in rural places um, at least report and, and tell me that that they're feeling like there isn't as much opportunity as there as there used to be. So you know, if we want to build a a society where, where everyone has the opportunity to pursue something that is meaningful and purposeful to them. Um, you know, I think in, in our generation, we're going to have to craft um, a new social contract. You know, this is, you know, this is something that every generation has basically done. Um, you know, previous generations fought for, you know, things like the vote and, and civil rights and the New Deal um, as kind of a new economic safety net for people. And um, I think it's, it's just a matter of time before, before our generation kind of decides on, on what um, our, our social contract is going to be. And, you know, I, I think that as I've traveled around, one of the things that I've just seen is, um, you know, our generation especially just cares a lot about um, making sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to pursue what is meaningful to them. So, I don't know, it's been interesting. I'm actually, I'm curious to, to, to hear from folks who are, who are watching this, um, you know, what your experience is, especially if you live in, um, in, in a rural place or in, in one of these um, in, in, in one of the states that I, that I visited, if, if you think I've, um, I've missed something in what I've, I've tried to write about. Um, and each time I go to one of these places, I, I don't write about every place that I go to. I probably write about half of them, um, just because it takes a while to write. But, um, but I've tried to share some of my, some of my experiences as I've, as I've traveled around. Um, all right, so what, what else is going on here? Good evening from Scotland. James, yeah, hey, glad to have you with us, hanging out in um, in our in our backyard here from Scotland. <laughs> All right, yeah, no, nothing beats traveling, Luella. That's right. Ime, just saw you. Uh, you're watching. What's going on? How are you doing this weekend? Um. All right, May from Malta. Yeah, grilling is fun. Karen in Arkansas. Yeah, Arkansas is, is, a, is a great place. I um, I visited a, a couple of years ago and spent spent a few days there. Um, Philip Hoffman, when am I coming to London? Um, 
I don't know, probably sometime sometime in the next, I don't know, next couple of years. I, I have no trip planned there right now, but I, I go to Europe almost every year. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there for, for us, uh, and, you know, a lot of communities to meet with for Facebook. Um, you know, this year I've, I've focused a bit more on, on traveling around the U.S., you know, kind of trying to figure out, um, you know, learn about different communities here that I wouldn't normally get, get as much exposure to, just, you know, living in California, but, um, but I'll definitely get to Europe and, and Asia in the next in the next year or so. Uh, Rayhan, is my is my year of travel uh, U.S. or global? My, my personal cha- challenge this year is to go visit each of the states that I haven't been to before. So that's going to be about 30 of the 50 U.S. states, and I'm about 23 states done. Um, I had to move some of that up in the year once we once Priscilla and I figured out that we were that we were having another baby. This this uh. In, in, in a couple of months, so I'll, I'll be in, in Palo Alto for a while. Um, really looking forward to that. Um, all right, what is uh, what, what is going on? Yeah, all right. So, Vicky Johnson um, from from Homer, Alaska. Uh, oh, you're from Homer. That's great. Um, uh, Homer's beautiful. I mean, Alaska's beautiful. I can't believe I haven't been there until until this year. Um, you know, it's. I, I wrote this this long post there, but one of the things that struck me is the the way that um, Alaska has structured some of their um, some of their safety. Right. So, you know, one of the the big things that that um, you know some people like to talk about is is this idea of a, of a guaranteed income or basic income. And one of the things that I found interesting is Alaska actually has that in a couple of ways. So, um, you know, they, they, they established this thing uh, a, a while back where when the, the state uh, sold rights to, uh, to companies to, to drill for oil, um, they took some of that revenue and they basically just give it to, uh, to all the Alaskan citizens as a dividend. Right? So it's not the way that, you know, most people think about building a safety net. Where, um, where most people think that, that you will that you'll increase taxes to do that, and you know I think that's that probably to some degree we need to do, but um, but the, the Alaskan experience is just interesting, uh, just seeing seeing what's uh, what's worked there for for a while. Um, I mean they also you know I, I've gone uh, as I've traveled around I've gone to a few different uh, Native American uh, reservations in, in different places and. The, the Alaskan system for the Alaskan natives is also um, quite different from, from around the rest of the country in that they actually have these corporations uh, they call native corporations that, that own the land and that um, they also develop the land and when they uh, make revenue from, from the land they, um, they give that back to, to Alaska natives as a dividend as, as well. So I mean there's, there's a lot of kind of that, that, whole, that whole structure and, and different ways of thinking about the safety net um, in Alaska, that you know, I don't know that it, that it necessarily makes sense for for the rest of the country to do it in that way, um, and, and certainly there are a lot of different ways to think about building a safety net. But one of the things that I do feel strongly about, and that I know a lot of people in, in my generation agree with, is that we really want to give everyone um, the opportunity to go pursue what matters to them and to go make a big difference. Right? I mean, I, I was you know when I wrote my my Harvard commencement this year, I was you know really. Uh, one of the things that I tried to be really clear about is, you know, you, you don't get to be successful like this just by, you know, being hardworking, right, or having a good idea. You, you, you have to get lucky in today's society um, in order for that to happen. And, you know, that, I, I think, is a huge issue because, you know, right now, when there are all these people who don't have the opportunity uh, to go pursue their dreams or go build a new business, you know, we all lose for that, right? If, if you, um, you know, are, are watching this, uh, you know, had, had more opportunity to, um, to go build something that would be a historic business or enterprise that could um, serve people all around the world, that would improve the economy and give services to, to all of us that, uh, that we could all benefit from. So you know, I, I think that in our generation, we've kind of realized that you know, making sure that we invest in the, in the safety net to give everyone that opportunity to go build um, you know, what matters to them and explore new ideas is actually how we're going to uh, make the most progress and um, and improve everyone's lives, not just in the U.S., but around the world. All right, so uh, what, what else are we, are we wondering about here? Um, 
You know, all right, Lucy Chung asking about kids. Your kids are entering middle school. Congratulations on making it that far. Um, I look forward to that one day. Um, and there, and you're asking about the the tech curriculum and and what ideas uh, to get public school standards caught up um, to to technology now. Um, you know, I can tell you what we're working on, right? So the Priscilla and I run uh, this philanthropic organization, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where we've committed to to giving 99% uh, of, of all of our our, our Facebook shares and, and wealth um, to to uh, giving them away, right, to different causes, focused first on education and, and science, um, and, and some some areas of of, of uh, policy advocacy, and. Um, and in education, what we're working on is is mostly around personalized learning, and it's this idea that you know all students learn in different ways and at different paces, right? So if you uh, just get math intuitively, um, you know, but you have to sit through a lot of lectures, then um, you know maybe you know, that's not the most engaging thing for you, and you're uh, you're not you're not learning as much as you could. But at the same time, maybe it's maybe it's harder for you to, to learn math or, or harder for you to, to get history. Then, you know, if the, if the lecture is just going at a, at a, at a normal pace, um, you might get left behind. And once you, you start falling behind, then it's, it's really hard to catch up and, uh, and, and, and ever gain a mastery of the subject. So, you know, one of the things that personalized learning does is, is helps people learn at their own pace. It also lets you learn uh, based on whatever kind of content makes sense for you. So if, um, you know, so if you learn best by watching a video uh, or by playing a game, right, that has practice problems, which, you know, especially we're seeing a lot in that math, um, or by doing practice problems with other students or by getting tutored by a teacher, you know, you want to have a school system that makes it so that you can get the kind of, um, of content and curriculum that matches to, to how you want to learn. And so we start building these tools, uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, in, in partnership with um, this, this uh, organization called Summit Public Schools. It's you know, one of the great uh, personalized learning uh, organizations. And, um, and when we started working together, you know, I said to the, the founder of, of Summit Public Schools, you know, I, I'm really excited about helping you build this technology and these tools to make these schools better, but we'll, I, I just have one term, which is that whatever we build together uh, needs to be available to every school in the country. And she said, of course, yeah, you know, we, we want uh, to, to spread this model. It seems to be working really well. And um, we've been working on it for about three years. And, you know, in the first year, I think it was about 20 new schools adopted the model. So all kinds of schools, um, district schools, charter schools, uh, private schools, all, all different kinds. Uh, and then uh, in the second year, about 100 new schools signed on. And uh, I think we're about to start our, our third year. And there are a lot more schools signing on now. So it's um, that's, that's exciting and promising. And I think that personalized learning using um, – giving teachers the, the power to teach uh, students in the way that they want and to be more of a coach for the students and do what they really want to do um, is, is really going to be an important trend uh, in education over the next 10 or, or 15 years. All right. Um, yeah, okay. So here, so there's a bunch of questions about um, some other work that we're, that we're doing here. Um, Lorna is, is asking about cystic fibrosis. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that Priscilla and I have been really focused on is, um, is this idea that, that it should be possible to cure, prevent, and manage all diseases within our children's lifetimes. Right? It's not going to happen in the next 5 or 10 or, or 15 years. But, you know, when you think about the pace at which science is, is accelerating, and, um, and all the technological progress that's getting made, um, it really should be possible to, to make significant progress on you know, the most of or all of the things um, that, that uh, affect people today and that people die from, right? So whether that's cancer um, or neurodegenerative diseases or heart diseases or um, infectious diseases all around the world. And you know, one of the reasons why I'm, why I'm so focused on this and why, why I care a lot about it is, you know, you hear a lot in um, in the, the the social debates of today around healthcare, and you know I think it's really important that we serve every person, uh, and, and that every person has has the healthcare they need. But you know one of the, the big issues in doing this is that it's really expensive today because we don't have cures and preventions for all these diseases. So if you're looking out, you know twenty or thirty or or forty years as to how do we really provide 
every person in our society with um, with the, the health care uh, that they need and with, with, a, with a system overall that just keeps people healthy so that they don't even need to um, seek health care as often. I think the real answer there is investing in uh, disease health. So, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I think is, is very is fascinating is that as a society, we spend only about um, one fiftieth as much uh, trying to cure and prevent diseases as we spend treating people who are sick. And I, I personally think that if we invested more uh, in organizations like the NIH um, and around the world, uh, great organizations that are doing this kind of research, if we if we just invested more in that, then I think we could accelerate those cures and preventions um, and, and bring them in a little bit sooner, which not only will, will increase the quality of, of, of care that people get, but it'll make it more affordable for, for our country um, and countries around the world to pay for. Um, you know, it's this stuff has the property where you know, how expensive the healthcare system is um, depends on, on how much um, people are getting sick. And, you know, if you can catch this stuff sooner and, and cure people more easily, then it's actually going to be more affordable and we'll be able to increase the quality for everyone. But it, but it starts with making uh, those long-term uh, science investments. One of, uh, one of my favorite quotes that I, I think is attributed to, to Bill Gates is that we always overestimate what we can get done in two years and we underestimate what we can get done in 10 years, right? So people spend all this time um, arguing about and focusing on on sometimes pretty marginal changes to things uh, that you're trying to get done in the next, you know, six months or a year or two years. And I, I guess I, I shouldn't be so dismissive of that because there, there are, of course, some really big things that you can do that are really important that could be either really good or really bad. But, but I always believe that um, if you really want to improve things for, for your children and really improve things down the line, you should focus not on things um, that are going to come to fruition in a year, uh, but focus on things that will take you know five or ten years to, to build, because fewer people are focused on those, um, so your effort on those is going to uh, be more special and differentiated and unique, and you're going to get more leverage from doing that, and you're probably going to be able to um, help solve something that, that ends up making a bigger difference than, than if you're just focused on, on the near term. All right. Um, so let's see. So... Uh, a bunch of interesting questions. Alex Clocus, when it comes to charitable giving, what do you think about movements like effective altruism and orgs like GiveWell? Um, I, I, I think that the notion of effective altruism is generally very important. Right? It's, you know, I think when you are lucky enough to have made a lot of money, uh, you have a responsibility to use it for the things that are going to create the most good uh, for the most people around the world. And you know, I think today a lot of people give to philanthropy and to, and to charity, um, but a lot of people give to um, to things that are that are personal interests of theirs. And you know that's not necessarily bad because you know, when something's a personal interest of, of yours, you tend to know more about it and you can probably give a little bit more effectively. But I also think that there's a real place, especially for um, for people who have a lot of money that they need to um, give philanthropically, um, you, you want to make sure that you're running it like an effective organization, like a company, right? Not just at your whims giving to things that um, that, you, that you think are good. And that's why you know we run the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative like it's a a, a real um, like it's a, a real professionally managed company. You know, we hired um, some of the best people in education and in science and and in advocacy and technology. Uh, to build out those organizations. I mean, on, on education, we have Jim Shelton. I mean, he was a uh, really senior person in, in the uh, Department of Education uh, in the Obama administration and uh, really helpful there. Um, Corey Bargman runs the Science Initiative. She's, um, uh, uh, hold on a second. I think our, our grill is, uh, is uh, yeah, all right. Let's, uh, let's, we got to get it back, back to a good temperature. 